Looking to create wealth and income through high cash flowing real estate? Self storage is the fastest growing and the newest real estate asset that has outperformed all others. What's its secret? I'm AJ Osborne, and with over a million square feet that we have built, acquired, expanded, and even converted big box stores from small third tier markets to large 100 plus thousand square foot facilities, we have seen it all. This is the podcast that we're going to discuss and bring on the best investors and operators in the nation to show you how to create wealth and income with self-storage. Welcome to Self-Storage Income. Welcome, everybody, to the Self Storage Income Podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by both of our amazing sponsors, Live Oak Bank and Janus International. If you haven't heard lately, we've had a couple episodes recently where uh, listeners who are now investors have actually reached out to Live Oak Bank and gotten their financing, whether they went the SBA route or a different route. Uh, they've done their financing through Live Oak and talked to Terry at Live Oak Bank and all that stuff. So that's been just incredible feedback and so cool to see all of this come full circle where, you know, we choose Live Oak to come in and be our sponsor for the podcast uh, to provide this and continue to provide it for you guys and provide this value. And that you're getting that value and then you're bringing that value like full circle for us to be able to see like that actually helping you guys, which is so cool. And uh, we're so, so honored to have Live Oak as a part of the podcast. And uh, again, they've got a lot of really amazing incentives going on as far as their SBA loan programs. And we've actually, we've got a podcast. I'm, I'm hoping we've got a podcast lined up with Terry coming up here soon. So we're going to have him on, talk everything finance again, talk about some of these changes and current events and things going on. So that's going to be really exciting. Looking forward to that. Uh, link is in the show notes. Go check out Live Oak. Awesome people. Great stuff going on there. Can't say enough good stuff about them. Our next sponsor, Janus International. You guys have to check out all of their amazing solutions, self-storage-wise. Uh, so many of these facilities that we own and operate, I'm talking you guys out there, us, they're old. They need to be brought up to today's standards, today's user experience and expectations, and uh, Janus International has those solutions for that. So they're no-key systems. Keyless, keyless access allows people to rent units, access a facility, store their stuff, leave the facility without ever talking to or interacting with a manager if that's what they need or want to do. Super awesome tool. Love it. And they also have a ton of programs going on with their, they call it their R3 program. And um, it's their effort to revitalize storage facilities, whether that's uh, I'm, I'm, I've heard, I've heard whispers, they, they do doors, all these things, but I've heard whispers of them also getting into the realms of roofing and siding and all these other aspects as well to really have an all-encompassing one-stop shop solution for us owner, operators, investors that need to bring those facilities up and repair those facilities, make them look nice, have a good product offering for consumers. Uh, they are a fantastic option. Janus International, get at them. Link is in the show notes. Go check it out. With that, you guys enjoy this episode. Welcome everybody to Self Storage Income. And today we get to talk with John Farling and how he got to six facilities and what he's doing now. Um, really excited to have him on. Uh, can't wait for, for this one to get started. Once again, we just had a lineup of some great people and it's been a really good way for us to explore certain areas and introduce new ways of doing things. So I think you guys are going to really join that. And without any further ado... We're going to bring him in. How's it going, man? Great. Appreciate you guys having me. Appreciate all the content and value you guys are uh, providing everybody. Thank you. We appreciate it. Well, thanks for coming on and uh, being willing to share strategies and tips with others out there. You know, that's what we're all about. We, you know, our kind of goal is free content to let everybody know and uh, you're participating in it. So, you know, us and all our listeners appreciate it. But what? why don't you give us, tell us a little bit about you, where you're from um, and kind of, you know, let's get started there. Sure. Uh, I live in Columbus, Ohio. I've uh, been here, uh, I don't know, 14 years or so um, from Ohio. But um, yeah, I mean, going way back, my, uh, my parents were in real estate. Um, they owned one duplex. 
um, for a few years. It, it, it failed miserably. Uh, but they also built spec homes, um, I think between 25 or 30 of them while I was growing up. So I was always around real estate. Um, I just kind of had, uh, you know, an, an itch for it too. So, um, fast forward a little bit, um, uh, did outside sales for electrical contractor of all things, uh, in Columbus, Ohio, started that 11 years ago. And, uh, eventually we had our first kid. Uh, my wife and I, uh, that was 2014, and started thinking, you know, what are we going to do with, one, retirement, and then, two, uh, how are we going to try to pay for a college education? And uh, that kind of led me back to real estate. Um, four years after that, acquired one um, single-family rental per year. At that point, was scaling way too slow. Um, so started looking at other avenues, apartments, and this was what, 2019? Um, the market's still hot, obviously, but the market was hot then. Couldn't find anything multifamily. Started looking at small businesses to buy. Um, was actually looking at a car wash. That led me down the path of SBA loans and found self storage. And uh, here I am, basically two years later after uh, acquiring my first facility. This is, uh, dude, I love it. It's so exciting. So, um, you know, First of all, congratulations. What a great you know two years, and uh, I, I love hearing about people's journey. And you did fast. I mean, six facilities, two years, you know, you just dove into this market. Um, why don't you run through through us on your first facility? How big was it? What you know, how'd you find it? Give us, you know, kind of that journey as you're going into it, you know, like who were you talking to? Was it a broker? All that kind of stuff. Sure. So um late what was it, 2018, um, started sending out some mailers, uh, bought a list, and uh, was concentrated on areas like Columbus, Ohio. Bigger, you know, it's a bigger area. Um, didn't get any traction. I, I don't know how many mailers I sent out. I did make some phone calls, but no traction. Yeah. Uh, ended up finding Mike Wagner, I believe from, uh, he was probably on Bigger Pockets at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, talked to him a few times, and, and I'm part of his community now. Um, but he basically led me to um, look to rural and uh, tertiary uh, markets, secondary markets. So um, I basically made my own list. Uh, my first mailing was about 60 facilities. Um, the towns range from like 10,000 people to we'll call it 60 or 70,000 people. And uh, out of that um, group of 60 mailers, I was able to land uh, two deals out of that. Um, both of them are relatively the same size. Uh, one's 12,000 square feet, other's 13,000 square feet. Um, different looking facilities. Uh, the one is uh, from the late 70s, uh, but numbers are, are almost identical. Use SBA loans for both those. Um, but yeah, direct that's mail awesome. marketing. Yeah. yeah, direct mail marketing. That's how I found all my other facilities too. You know, it's interesting because you curate, uh, you're curating your own list. That's how we do it here. So we actually curate our own lists and we make them. Uh, one of the problems you have with lists that you buy is everybody else's bottom. Right. And I found that the, everyone that I talk to, generally speaking, that is probably the, as far as capital goes and everything, it's one of the lowest ways that I've seen of actual acquisitions. And I, I've all my off market deals, which literally until this year was every single one, um, all, all the deals that it, it never came from that. We tried some strategies. I never got any deals. It never got any good ones either. Um, even leads it kind of interesting that this has been a universal story that I've, that I've heard. Um, it just doesn't seem to work that well. Mm hmm. Sure. Well, yeah, brokers, you know, hitting the same list. Yeah, exactly. And really, until I talked to Mike, I never thought about investing in, you know, rural areas, areas with 12,000 population. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, yeah, brokers, I think brokers now are hitting those areas. But back, okay. you know, all <laughs> For years sure. ago, uh, they weren't hitting it as hard then. Yeah, no, I think that's a really important dis, uh, point to distinguish for everybody as well that are just starting out where they they just hear like, okay, yeah, direct mail, it worked. It worked in this asset class. It worked for here. It worked for there. And being able to recognize that obviously in real estate or any business, there's not like this one size fits all process, but 
you know, there, there are the fundamentals in these tools that you can use like the mailers, but you have to apply those correctly yeah. and in the right markets where it's like you're in, I'm assuming like more of a first tier market and sending out mailers and you're like, okay, well that didn't work. And there's a lot of people that would probably be like, okay, mailers didn't work. I'm not meant to do this. Like this sucks. Like yeah. screw AJ and self storage income. Like <laughs> it was just, you know, so I, yeah, I think that's really important for a lot of people to hear and understand where, you know, use these tools, but you have to apply them correctly. Yeah. You know, once you send out those mailers in these, these third tier markets with populations of 12,000 or less or whatever it was you're targeting, then boom, there you had two deals. And that's incredible. Out of 60 mailers, that's pretty rad. Because, I mean, what did that cost you for 60 mailers to get two deals? Well, yeah, I would smore <laughs> pot than anything. Yeah. 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 Well, and the other thing that I see is what are you putting in your mailers? Mm, um, yeah. A lot of these people are treating it like, they're trying to buy, they're trying to wholesale single family, uh, you know, houses, mm -hmm. you know, you're talking to mom and pop yep. for the most part, majority of the owners I've bought from are retirees mm -hmm. and you know, they don't want to hear that, you know, they don't want to hear much, you know, they're, they may be interested in selling. And I mean, my mailer was so simple. It was almost dumb. Just, yeah. Hey, I've sold some single family rentals. want to get in self storage. And that was basically it. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people, I've got some here that I'm getting, getting some mailers. People are writing like a page yeah. of just, you know, I, I don't know what they're even saying. I, I read the first <laughs> sentence and I'm done. I throw it away. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, you know, we talk, I talk about this a lot where it's like, there's this idea that there should be a one strategy fits all. And that's just not true. That's not how it works. And, you know, my strategy from beginning to end, it changes all the time. I'm already preparing for our next strategy move. We're already changing everything up because I already know the change is coming and what's coming. I've changed the last three years and I've changed the years before that. And that's why we keep getting deals. That's why we keep growing. That's why we keep finding because investing is dynamic. You have to change yeah. with the times. And if you are doing what everybody says is the mode, the market's saturated. There's no opportunity there. So you got to look away from it and you got to apply fundamentals in a different way way so like i say my strategy's changed but my strategy to find has changed not to run not to operate the value add systems never changed right? right but how i'm applying those fundamentals of value add everything like that that has changed dramatically and continues to everything from conversions to developments to you know all these different tools that we have you know it's like arrows in your quiver and you got to be able to use the right ones mm -hmm. right so true. Yeah, no, completely agree. Yeah, that's and I don't think a lot of people are doing that. Um, you know, as, as I said before, I think a lot of people are they've got experience with wholesaling houses or yeah. they've got multifamily experience and um, they don't know how to adapt. Um, I think I was probably made for this because I did send out some mailers for single family and multifamily and didn't get any traction until I switched to storage. I think. Uh, my, my method probably fits those, uh, mom and pop owners that I was talking to in these rural areas. Yeah, no, that's, that's huge. Uh, you know, aligning yourself with them and being, you know, just a normal guy, you know, you're not this real estate investor coming to take their baby away from them, essentially, you know, yeah. it's like something that they built with their hands a lot of times, uh, over the years. Yeah. So um, many of ours were handshake deals. Literally. Mm -hmm. We were just, I went out, yeah. I had relationships with the owners that I went out intentionally built, but you know, I talk about this all the time like, this is a people game and you need to be able to not only be real but put yourself in a position where you're having a discussion um two people just too many people just want an automated soulless numbers driven right and that was never how we got off market deals that's never how we got deals it was mm -hmm. relationships even off market deals with brokers it was relationships that we had built up when we went out and found a deal we went and approached the owner we went and talked to them. We went and learned. And sometimes they didn't sell it to us for two years, three years. But then when the time was right, we were the ones they sold to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So talking about your... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to jump into your... So you had the first facility jumping into your second facility. How did that look? I know there's a lot of people that are like, okay, you know, they get that first one. And it's like, okay, well, then how do I get to that next one? Because obviously like you're bit by the bug, right? And you're like, I got to get the second one. So what did that process look like for you, uh, you know, on the finances and also finding that deal and going through that whole process on that second one? 
Yeah, so the, um, I landed them right around the same time, within a few months of each other. Um, the first one I closed in June of 19. second one took around six months to close. It's an SBA loan, um, and if anyone's familiar with the SBA, you need to fit in their box. Um, and that was a problem for you. You have to fit in their box and the sellers have to fit in their box and the sellers, um, <laughs> had some struggles with that. So it took a little bit longer to, to close. Um, yeah. but yeah, SBA one for both 15% down for both. Were you um, using your own money or were you getting other people? Yes. Yep. All my deals I've used my own money. Now, part of that is, um, I've used a HELOC. Mm -hmm. Um, I've actually cashed out my 401k. Um, I've also sold four rentals. So I had quite a bit of cash just from those options. Uh, but yeah, my first two deals were, uh, HELOC and cash. Um, after I saw my first deal, I knew my second one was going to work. And a after I had my second one, you know, I was a month into it. I'm like, I'm all in. I saw the returns. I wasn't going to find that anywhere else. Um, and started sending out, I say more mailers, but I, my second group was maybe a hundred mailers. Um, and yeah, I was, yeah, off to the races then. That's awesome. That's awesome. So what is your, what is your deal flow look like? Like, how are you finding these deals now? And obviously, like AJ said, going, uh, you've got the six facilities at this point in just a couple of years. I mean, that's, that's a huge scale. What are you doing to bring those deals to you? Um, so going forward or going forward? Yeah. Like, what are you doing now? Yeah. How are you finding those and how are you scaling so, so more, quickly? Yeah. So those were just, um, direct mail letters um, going forward now um, I'm networking um, probably partnering with some people um, going forward um, I, I so right now I'm going through a cash out uh, refi um, refinancing my my properties into the portfolio loan with life insurance money so at this point I'm kind of equity heavy um, I need to get a little bit of cash out there in order go. to keep growing uh, but yeah, right now it's been all my own money. Uh, I have not um, done the private investor route, but that will probably come come next. I have not been on a heavy search for deals this year. Um, I'm I don't want to say comfortable, but I left my job, which was my pain point. Um, yeah. I wanted out of that job, so I had that was my superpower. I had something pushing me. Now it's um, you, you know you know and I, and I know this, um, and I'm also trying to balance. Um, how much I'm working compared to how much freedom I want. Um, so I'm trying to play that game too. How many facilities can I have where I can work when I want, where I want, how I want. Um, yeah, no, it's so. a balance. Mm -hmm. No, that's a perfect segue into like, how do you, how do you do that? How do you manage these? Yeah. So, um, I've got a call center, uh, easy storage mm -hmm. solutions. Um, then I have boots on the ground, helpers at each facility. Um, and my facilities are pretty low maintenance. Um, you know, a lot of them, I'd say at least 70% of my renters have been there at least five plus years. Even with my rent raises, they stay. Um, in fact, I've got, and I'm sure, you know, you guys too, and a lot of people that are listening, you know, I've got renters that have five, six, seven units themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, so they're low turnover. So it's, it's low. My, my helpers don't have much work, you know, maybe an hour a month, maybe two hours a month at most, um, peak season. So that's how I'm running it. I did just hire an assistant two weeks ago to help with, um, emails, um, uh, from the call center and just kind of operations things. Um, she'll probably take over the, uh, my boots on the ground guys here soon. So, um, yeah, my job will basically be, uh, answering any questions she has and finding more deals. Nice. Nice. And what roles are those that you have those boots on the ground? Yeah. So, uh, you know, you think about a move-in process, um, the unit has to be empty, has to be cleaned. Um, so that's what they're doing with the units. They're picking up trash. Um, I've got vendors that, um, if there's grass, they mow the grass. Um, and my boots on the ground guys stop by, at minimum once a week, um, but usually twice a week just to do quick rounds. Again, I've got uh, my biggest facility is uh, 30,000 square feet, so still relatively small. Um, and that guy, I think, goes there like every 10 days. He's not there very often. Uh, but I also have what, what's helped is um, I have cameras 
at each facility. So I can, for the most part, see what's going on. And uh, my gate is tied to my call center slash website. So my boots on the ground doesn't have to do anything with lockouts. Um, if someone's late, they're locked out. They're locked out at the gate through the software automatically. Um, so, yeah, my, my, my helpers don't have much work. No, that's awesome. That's a really great way to, to automate that as much as possible, especially on those smaller facilities like that, yeah. where that's such a huge expense and, and an issue for people to figure out is, you know, how do you hire somebody and how do you still cash flow and all that stuff? Um, that's, that's awesome. Um, as far as the, uh, like, how, how do tenants rent when they're coming in? So since you don't have somebody just there at an office or something like that, how does that process work? Yeah, they, uh, they can either call the call center and the call center will move them in um, or they can go online to our website and rent that way. And what we do is they'll get, um, if they run online and, and similar, if they call in the call center, they'll get a, a code for the gate and then they'll get their unit number. And we actually put a, a combination lock on the vacant units. So they'll get those three things, um, texted to them, emailed to them, um, or given to over the phone, and then they enter the gate, use a combo code, get in their unit, and move in. Awesome, that's great. That's sweet. Now, when you, you talked about your like your finance stuff, you're going to do a portfolio loan to take some money out. You've been doing uh, the smaller facility and everything. Are you going to continue on doing the boots and ground? Because as you get more facilities, right, it gets a lot harder to do a lot of certain aspects of them. What are you going to change? I mean, this is a big move for you, right? Portfolio alone, you're going to take a big chunk out. What do you think you could do better when buying, running, renting? Like what, what are your, uh, you've now owned it. So now you know, actually know how this works. So I'm always interested to see now, okay, how am I going to do better? Or what am I going to do? What are your thoughts? No, that's a great question. Um, right now I know where I need to improve and that's the call center. Um, They've been, and I don't want to say no fault of their own, but they've been, since COVID, basically, um, they've been inundated with uh, more storage facilities, owners coming to them. They can't keep up. So for the month, they're not answering many of my phone calls. Um, and not, not to throw them under the bus. But yeah, that's my weakness right now. I need to figure that portion out. Um, I'm working on that right now. It's not a huge pain point because for the most part, I'm, 94, 95% full across the board um, with rent raises and everything else. So, um, yeah, that, that's my pain point. Um, I also need to go in, and I've done that my last my last couple. I need to go in and raise rents um, as soon as I take over the facility. Because, you know, I'm, I'm buying a lot of these where rents are half or 30% of what market rates should be. Yeah. Um, initially, I was afraid to you know, throw the bandaid off and raise them. Um, still somewhat timid, but just yeah, do it, just, man. Just rip it <laughs> off. Go all Don't on. even wait. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Those two are my weaknesses right there. No, it, it's, you know, it's interesting how I, I remember like when, when we first started even we're like, could we really raise rates that much? And how many people are going to move out? Everything. And then midway through, we're buying facilities. Hey, we're going to give 130% raise. It's too far out of line. <laughs> and uh, we're fuller than when we were when we started. And what I yeah. think, you know, is hard to realize is that there, there's, first of all, there's different types of customers, right? And you need units to sell. That's part of it. But also, one unit full of someone that's half off, you're just saying no to someone that is willing to pay full. And I like to say, it's nothing against them. They're just not the customer I'm attracting. So you need to go to a facility that is okay with that. I want higher paying tenants so I can improve the facility, work on operations, so I can do customer service. I'm not trying to be the low end. But in order to be the high end, I also need high paying tenants to support that you know, that customer service, that look, maintain the facility. Um, so once I understood, you know, once I think I got it in my mind, is you're just not my customer. So it's okay for you to leave. Um, but that can be a hard, so, <laughs> a hard transition. Yeah. Easier said than done. Yeah. Yes. So, so let me ask you this. So I have this, and I know it's a limited mindset, but I have this, I don't want to call it fear, but I just yeah. said that a lot of my facilities are 
um, low maintenance because I've got majority of my people are, have been there for years. Yeah. I do think if I raise those rates, you know, for example, um, 10 by 20, my one, they're probably paying around 70. I, my street rates are now 130. If I raise them over 100, those people are moving out. Now, what's my cost to get new renters? Um, are those renters not going to pay? All those things go through my mind. Yeah. So that's why I haven't ripped the Band-Aid off with a lot of those people. Yeah. It, this is how I look at it. So first of all, it does increase a little bit of work, right? Because you got to acquire new customers and everything. But if you look at the long, uh, the lifetime value of, of a tenant, so those people aren't going to leave. Why? Because you have a, they, they have a good deal, right? Of course, they're not going to leave. Because, uh, but if you look at their lifetime value, the amount of money that you're going to lose over five years is crippling to your business. It's not even like when you, I look at it in five, 10 years or how, if I extrapolated that to all of them area, I go, holy cow, I can't even run my business the way that I want to. Then I'd be, have a sense of urgency. I got to get you out, right? I, like you need to leave. Um, and if you don't not even leave, you just need to pay what is considered a market rate, what is fair and rational. And I, I, we've done a good job in a a lot of instances, sometimes we've done a bad job, but we've really tried to work in letting the tenants understand and know. And two, also, if they're that far under market rate, how many options do they really have? Like mm-hmm. you say they're going to leave. Where are they going to go? Right. So a lot of times people are like, we're going to leave. Funny story. I don't, I don't mean this to be like, I, I, I'm sure I should be sensitive to. I just think it's funny. So we take over facilities and we have to get them up to market rates. The facility I was just mentioning, right? Our average rate increase was like 78%. We had somebody that got really mad at us, right? Okay. We had a lot of people that were mad at us, but <laughs> um, it was a really poor manage and it was owned by the state. So the state never gave tax. Like they just had a deal that didn't exist in the market. So it was so out of whack that it wasn't fair. So we're like, you've had a good deal for a really long time. Now you got to be normal in a marketplace that was unfair. But when we got it, he got a large rate increase. Well, he was upset, everything like that. He's like, we're leaving. We're like, okay, we understand. That's totally fine, right? He left, went three miles down the road and rented from my other storage facility and paid more. <laughs> wow. So he's still my tenant. He's just paying more uh, than even he was right. at that. So when you get in a marketplace, but it, it, it made me remember and made me think he had nowhere else to go. Mm-hmm. The only other place he had to go was me. And he had to pay a premium from what the rate increase that I was even giving him to an already existing facility that only had 4% vacancy. So he got one of the last units and paid a huge premium. I mean, his rate went way up. Plus he had to incur all the cost of moving. He was just doing it out of spite. It wasn't a logical decision. It didn't make any sense, right, at all. He just was mad about it, which was fine. You can be mad about it. You can go. But customers that are that severely under market rate, they may be mad, but the bulk of them understand, oh, I actually have to pay what's fair and reasonable now, right? So I always remember where they're going to go, first of all, right? Uh, But more importantly, try to communicate that with tenants. As you know, we've taken this over. We have to incur taxes. We want to improve our asset. We are taking care of it. We have to bring market up to rate. They can complain and they will, right? And that's fine. But we always make sure they understand why when we're giving them such a substantial rate increase. And two, lots of people that own lots of units, lots of times they're businesses they're operating on. We never have anybody, any problem with our main tenants and people like that because they understand it. They get it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, what I found interesting is um, I think I've only got one facility that has a REIT in town. And um, I am now, my street rates are now higher than some of theirs, Yep. which blows my mind. And I'm still renting them. Yep. It's crazy. And this is the problem with not raising rates. So one of the problems with not raising rates is, first of all, you're actually hurting the entire market. So think about inflation. Think about what's gone on in the market, right? What it took me five years ago to rent and hold a customer, oh my gosh, it's not even comparable to today, right? And some people aren't raising their rents. Well, what did your groceries not go up? Did gas not go up? Like you've got to keep up with market standards, inflation. And if you're not raising rents, it hits you both way because all my expenses have gone up over five years and a lot of them dramatically gone up. And so if I'm not even keeping up with that, you're getting hit two-sided, 
right? So people in general know, but what happens when, you, when like, you know, when you buy these facilities, it's like they're trained wrong, right? Like they've never received a rate increase. So they, they just assume that they never should. And uh, you give them a rate increase, then they're mad. And you're like, well, you just went like six years without a rate increase. Maybe you should say thank you. And uh, you don't even know where that top of that market is and where it's aligned. So you can start going higher, but in bad times, you're not able to raise rates. So what happens is, when people don't raise rates, when you get to bad times and you have a lot of vacancy, you've not increased your rates at all over that time. And the vacancy is almost the exact same as people that did. So during bad times, you're actually putting your business in peril. Like, because vacancies where they're at today, right? That's not historical norm, right? right. Self storage has never been better. For me, one of the reasons I raise rates is because I know it will get bad. It always does. It's inevitable. And I've been through the great recession with these assets. We were buying, building. I've been through all this time. And during the recession, there was two types of operators. One like me. I didn't raise rates. Then there was other operators who were good operators. They continued to raise rates. Once we, once we uh, all got back to normal, they were the same place I was. I had to catch up. It was, yeah. you know, it was a horrible business decision because during that time, our assets performed very, very poorly. And if I would have been more standardized, raised rents and been more reasonable and aggressive about it, we, our company would have been in a much better position. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I'm, uh, I need to send out a bunch of letters next week. Yeah. Right, right <laughs> yep. And it, it's, I, I, I mean... And two, also we're in the best time. So that's another mm -hmm. thing too, timing it, right? Do it now because um, like I always say, I don't know what next year will hold and I might not be able to get our rate increases out. And next spring and given markets, it, it takes one facility to ruin a market. You know, right. Somebody comes in and builds yep. a 200,000 square foot facility, over floods a market. You cannot ever get those rate increases anymore. And right. now you have vacancy. So it's, it's a proactive, it's a business sense, right? But I mean, you know, it sucks. It does, especially when you're just getting started. Now I'm very shielded from it right now. I have people to take care of that, things like that. But before I was literally taking the phone calls, I was dealing with the emails and people screaming at us. That's not fun. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's why I've hired an assistant. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> You're like, exactly. Here's all this stuff. <laughs> You're right. Send those letters out. I'm going on vacation. You can't reach me. <laughs> uh, exactly. Right. Yeah, what, what, what's funny is I hired her uh, four days before we went on vacation two weeks ago. Oh, too and funny. It was, and I told her, I'm like, you're not going to have more than two, three hours, what, four hours a month worth of work. I was like, it's not that much. <clears throat> and anytime I go on vacation, that is the busiest week or 10 days, whatever it is. <laughs> um, for whatever reason, you know, that's just so you're great at timing. Yeah. Good job, you're yeah. great at timing these things <laughs> exactly. So she had no idea what she was doing. Um, I still have my finger on things, but yeah, that's how things work out, I guess. <laughs> so, let me ask you this when you hired your assistant, what things did you outsource? Um, the main things is email. Um, I'm tired of living on my phone for the most part, yeah. Um, right now, that's what it is, she's answering emails. Um, and that's from sometimes the renters, uh, but mostly from the call center questions that they have that really they should know, um, but aren't consistent with that. And then, um, I also get after hours voicemails to the emails. Um, so she takes care of those too. So that's, yeah, gets me off from living on my phone all the time. No, that's, that's fantastic. Um, and obviously a, a really important part of scaling because you can't work on finding new deals. You can't work on building your company. You can't grow it if you're constantly just tr in maintenance mode, maintaining what you already have. Um, and, you know, that's part of scale. As you grow, you're going to have to get more and more things done. And that's, I, I don't know, to me, that's the fun part. Like I actually enjoy the scaling of a business part. Um, that starting out phase is so exciting and it's so great. And then it's like, how do we get to this next level? What do we do? Who are the people that we need on our team? I get so into that. And I, you know, I'm, I, I'm too into it because I, like it, I could play <laughs> all the time. Like, cause this is a game to me. This is the yeah. greatest game on mm -hmm. earth and I get to yep. play in it. And I'm like, and I get to play in it with people who I 
I love, I appreciate, I think highly of, and we're like, I'm like, oh, we're putting like an Avengers team together, right? And we're going mm-hmm. out there and we're taking over. And then my wife's like, maybe you should, uh, you know, not work so much. Maybe you should uh, come see the kids. I'm like, oh yeah, sorry. I was too busy playing with my friends. <laughs> yeah. like, right, right, AJ, it's right. time for dinner. <laughs> yeah, come exactly. Home. AJ, <laughs> time for dinner. Come on. I'm like, uh, oh yeah. man. <laughs> see you later, guys. Well, well, I think that's, you know, that's, all entrepreneurs, right? That's, you know, yeah. I, I enjoy, and I haven't gotten there yet, but I'm excited for that. And I don't know what that's going to look like. It may just be one person and maybe two. I don't know. Um, but I, yeah, I love the fact of, you know, you're buying a business that's, that's kind of sinking and you know, you're reviving it. I yes. love that. Um, I that do is too. my favorite part. I yeah. do too. Well, and you hit the nail on the head by by exactly what you said. You're buying a business, you know, Bingo. <clears throat> and that's what I think. So many of these uh, these single owner operators, you know, they've been in the industry for a while, uh, that they're missing. They're not running it like mm-hmm. a business. There's a lot of people out there that think storage is this super uh, passive cash cow thing that you don't have to do anything with, um, which isn't the case. Um, and uh, I mean, again, you, I mean, you should hit the nail on the head as far as calling it a business and running it like a business you're buying a business and that's exactly what you're doing you got to set it up like a business 100 percent processes and procedures yep you need consistency Mm -hmm. 100 percent too even when you look at like rate increases like for us um when you buy a facility that's never had a rate increase and you give a rate increase everybody loses their mind but then after i own that facility and i give everybody a rate increase every six to nine months nobody ever says anything ever and it's because yeah. the customers are trained, yeah. it's consistent, it's expected. Tenants don't like things that come out of left field. It, the price actually didn't even really matter. It's just that it surprised them. But once they're okay. getting consistent, and two, I'm not talking about 3% rate increase. Our average every six to nine month rate increase is somewhere from 8 to 15% across the board every time. No one ever complains. But if I took a facility over that's never had a rate increase and I gave them a 4% rate increase, everybody would freak out, right? So when you develop processes and systems, not only does the business run smoother, but your customers are way happier about it. I know who to contact. I know who I'm going to get an answer from. I know what to expect. It really does make everybody's life easier. And when you run an ad hoc, like, oh, just, you know, I'm doing whatever, your customers don't like that. We're so used to using services and particularly using services for big, large corporations, things like that, that are streamlined, that the more you imitate that, the more you're going to get customers that are willing to pay for that. And it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, No, definitely. And this is, you know, you you probably just hit the nail on the head where I need to improve. Um, I need to improve on, I've been sending, and granted, I'm, I'm still an infant in this. I've only been in it two years. Um, I have been sending rate increases basically once a year, um, but it sounds like I need to do that at least twice a year. Yeah, there you it's go. you know, and it's interesting too when you look at because when we got started started out, we didn't do obviously have stuff. I, I and this is why I love talking to people. I, I think I said this like it was like three podcasts ago where I'm like I love talking to people who are new and just starting out because it's like bring it brings me back. It's yeah. exciting, and two, you just found this whole new world that you love, and you're like, wow, I can really do something here, right? Like, I can yeah. really build something here. I can be yeah. good at this. And yeah. self-storage offers that in a way that a lot of asset classes don't. And it provides you the ability to learn and grow and make mistakes. So I have, like, Warren Buffett has his margin of safety. I have my margin of stupidity. And when I bought a business, it needed to be good enough to where I could do a lot of stupid things and it would still be just fine. And storage offered me the opportunity to, opportunity to be stupid. Thanks, storage. Um, and, you know, it, it, but really, it's true. Like, because I knew I'm not going to be perfect. I'm not going to know everything. So I'm going to screw up for years and I need to have a business model that allows me to grow as an investor as a business person and still be successful. So whether you're an infant, you know, whether you're this learning growth year, you're in an asset class, dude, that you can grow as much as you want, as little as you want. And it provides you the opportunity. That's so cool. Yeah. No, you hit the nail on the head. It's, I tell people too, that are, you know, I act like I've been a a while, but it's only been two years. It's so slow moving. 
it's you know i still make mistakes i mean obviously yeah. you know you uncovered one um but yeah my first facility i made mistake after mistake after yes. mistake i spent too much on stone just all these all mistakes i didn't yep. send my welcome letters to like a month in the ownership yeah. um you know and it, but it's so slow moving that it's like okay well i'm going to send them out next month and now everything's back to normal and, and everything's fine in the world yeah it's nothing it's so nice because knock on wood for the most part nothing is an emergency yeah um at worst someone's got some collectibles in there and whatever but yeah it's not like you're dealing with a flooded house yeah uh, yeah you know a fire i guess you can deal with fires but um it's someone's stuff they're not living there so it's not yeah. as urgent um it's 100%. just yeah it's a slow moving world and even right now i've seen some emails come across some text messages that I could probably answer next week and it wouldn't hurt my business whatsoever. Yep. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love what you just said about nothing's an emergency. Cause I think a lot of us get in this mindset of like, Oh my gosh, like this is happening. That's happening. This is going on. And this is something too, that, that, that I've seen even with our managers and things like that at facilities where it's like, Oh man, this is going on. This is that. And it's like, okay, uh, this is what we're going to do. Like you just need to do X, Y, and Z and you know, this will be fine. That'll yep. be fine. All I've, right. I've even had them tell me like, you're so calm. Like you must have like just crazy stuff going on or something. Like you have bigger fish to fry. You kind of just,